The following is a presentation of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Just a couple of verses from 2 Timothy. It will be the basis of our opening lecture. <clears throat> Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 1.8 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which, he had, which has been entrusted to you. Are there any prayer requests that weren't brought up today in chapel? Anything in particular before we pray? Let's pray. Almighty and glorious God in heaven, you who are truth, reveal all truth to us, who sent us the Savior, who's the way, the truth, and the life, who sent us the Spirit who has opened our eyes to behold truth and transformed our hearts to receive it. We bless your name that we may gather together to study the truth of your word. And particularly, Lord, as it has been uh, encased in our confessional standards of the confession and catechisms. We ask that as we study that you will give us uh, submissive obedient minds to the revelation of your truth and give us a quick understanding and cause these things, Lord, to sink deeply into our own being. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So a quick overview of the course. Purpose is a survey of the system of Christian thought using the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms as guides with the intent of grounding students in biblical reform theology. It includes readings in Calvin's Institutes as well as catechism memorization, as well as readings in two other books. Some objectives that each student will be able to do exegetically sound theology that each student will develop skills in biblical critical thinking and be equipped to evaluate non-biblical positions, that each student will have a general knowledge of all the doctrines of the Westminster Standards, that each student will have a cursory knowledge of Calvin's Institutes, that each student will love the truth studied and recognize the practical benefits of them in his life and ministry. And that's his because we do welcome you ladies, but you'll remember that and the course will apply to you in your pursuit of godliness and preparation for whatever callings God has for you, but we focus on preparing men uh, for the ministry and that each student will learn the appropriate questions and answers in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Mentioning women, and I think somebody has already asked this question, I'm going to ask uh, the women who are taking this for credit to participate in the round robin readings. Uh, I will ask you questions and you may ask questions as well and answer questions. Um, the difference is that, and I know you all, none of you would do this, is that you don't try to take over the class with your questions. They're honest questions. They can be questions that would challenge me, that's fine. 
Um, so, but I will be happy for you to speak during the class. Any questions about that? All right. Requirements. We got reading. Notice there was an error. Four hours a week assigned portion of the institutes. Now, you normally would spend six hours outside of this class for the three-hour class. So I've only required you to read four hours. I figure you're going to memorize your catechism, and you will want to uh, read the Course of the Confession, and you want to review uh, the material uh, from uh, the previous lecture. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be happy to read more than four hours. Uh, you'll profit if, as you do that. But I'm not putting down page limits. So you read at your own pace. Um, that's much more important to me is comprehension. I would encourage you as you read to take your um, copy of the Harmony and cross-reference <coughs> your institutes. Now I've given the institutes in books chapters and paragraphs because there's two different versions floating around and so I found out with doing pages that was not working because it's very different but I'm not accepting for this assignment the uh, new French translation from the French that Van der did a couple of years ago which is glorious and I think you know you would want to read it but I'm going to want you to read in the daddy of them all the 59 uh, version of the uh, of the institutes, so, um, and this is for your own just introduction. But I want you to feel free as we're talking about something in class, something that you got in your reading from Calvin, uh, as well as a question you would have from Calvin. We have posted uh, some questions to help you get some of the salient parts of the sections that you're reading in uh, the institutes, but uh, don't just be guided by those. Any questions about that part of the assignment? Um, <clears throat> is Belveridge's translation acceptable for the course? Which one? Uh, Belveridge. Beveridge or McNeil. That's why I'm, I'm putting them in a different... Um, so yes, that's a, it's, it's not as good a translation. But if that's what you have, um, don't spend money to get another one. So that's why I've done everything in terms of book, chapter, and section, and not page number. So the Westminster um, edition, mine's in the other room, uh, falling apart. It's as old as I am, I think. So anyway, um, it's the Westminster edition is uh, what most of us use, but yeah, the beverage is fine. Okay. Any other questions there? All right, let's get clear here on the catechism because obviously, and I'm not going to say who, can't read directions. Catechism answers are to be self-graded and sent by email to Mrs. Holmes at that email address the day of class. And I walked in there and the poor lady was having to grade catechism questions. And I said, no, 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 there's way too many people for that. So, you're getting grace today. If you didn't send in a self-graded catechism, do it, please. Um, and from now on, if you don't send in self-graded catechism, then it will be counted as no catechism. It's really simple to grade your own catechism. Uh, and so you, um, you learn it, you can write down the question, and then from memory write down the answer. Now, I'm going to do something that I discovered that Dr. Smith did, and that is you don't have to be satisfied with your first attempt. So as long as they're in by 3 o'clock, day of class at Tuesday, if you missed five in your first attempt and you want to review and do it again, do it. And if you want to do it again, do it. So as long as it's self-graded to her by 3 o'clock, day of class. Now, uh, we don't count off for spelling, Grammar are using uh, English and rather than the TH words. <laughs> so you don't have to say intended if you want to say intends. Uh, I give you that much uh, liberty when you, when you grade yourself. So 
You can miss one word, and that's uh, still an A. If you miss two words, uh, that then is an A minus, and on down, then little small baby steps. Uh, now, if you get a whole phrase out of there, um, you count how many words are in that phrase, and then you count off. So, if you get it misplaced. If it's misplaced, though, we might show some favor. We do in the exam, anyway. So, any question about how you're to do this? If you add a word, that's a minus one. <laughs> and just to be clear, that's per question, not... Right, 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 per that. question. Yeah, if we have three and... Uh, no, well, we're really generous. I mean, the whole purpose is for you to learn this, not to uh, penalize you. And then you will see them on your uh, two examinations, not cumulatively, whatever we have up through the midterm. You'll be tested on those, and then uh, the second half then tested on those. So that's the mistake there. It's four hours a week in the institutes. We'll try to have a lot of discussion. This is uh, uh, a wonderfully large class. I love it right now. I won't love it when I'm grading your papers, but that's okay. This is great. I'm so excited. Yes, sir? You mentioned with the questions. Remember asking the questions and the answers. No, I said you may write down the question and then write down from memory the answer. For the first uh, catechism, uh, the, the answer is man's chief end, but if I write it, the chief end of man. Uh, That's a mistake. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the advantages of catechism, it helps you develop precise thinking. So it's only one mistake, though. If you just switch, yeah, you got the words correct, you only switch the order, we're not going to count off two words for that. You're not going to count off two words for that. <laughs> You got a question, write a question mark by it, and then Miss Holmes can either decide or ask me. So, yeah, we've got what, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, and then how many are not here? It's close to thirty, isn't it? That's great. Um, so then, uh, Participation and discussion and memorization of catechism will count for about 15% of the course grade. We usually divide that 5 and 10. Uh, so if you got all your catechism, then you get 5. Maybe we'll do 7.5 even there and then for class discussion. It's hard to make anything but an A on class discussion as long as you're contributing and answering questions, showing that you are, are doing the reading. Now, distant students. Listen up. It's in your syllabus, but um, when you listen to this MP3 or go online, uh, you are to submit a one-page summary of some portion of the Institutes or other suggested reading on the topic of the day, and this compensates for missing class discussion. And I just want to limit that to the Institutes until we get to the two other books. So. Uh, it's the same holds true then if you need an unex if you need an excused absence. So if you're not going to be in class and you granted an excused absence, then you are. But if you've had time before the class to get that in before class, do so. But if the emergency has happened later, then you just get it to us by the end of the week. Now I'm going to change this. I, I have wrestled so much with. A useful assignment uh, and I've done a number of things uh, I think one year I actually had teams working to prepare lesson plans and that was very mixed because some teams had good members and some teams didn't have as many good members and so all the work would fall on one or two so that didn't work so then uh, we uh, I have um, assigned uh, portions of the Institute to be outlined. But you get this many people and you don't get to read a whole lot to do that. Plus I want it to be practical. Now when I had this with Dr. Smith, actually this is the course that I've always coveted and it was the last course he gave up. <laughs> but I had it with him 
in uh, 1968 or 69. Now, he had us do a whole book each. And so he assigned, and so I did, I did book three or four or whatever. Um, and that's a great exercise, but there's no way I'm going to read 30 uh, outlines of, of uh, full books of the Institute <laughs> and survive. No, really, uh, what I want to do, because I do want this, I want each of you to choose a chapter. So, ever how many chapters there are of the Confession? And Mrs. Holmes will post just a thing with 1 through 33. Uh, nobody can do adoption, okay? Because that's just... talking about the Institute. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the Confession. Did I say Institute? The Confession. So 1 through 33, but you cannot do the chapter on adoption. It's just... Well, it's a glorious chapter, though. No, I'll leave it in there. All right. So you just pick the chapter you want. It's first come, first serve. What I'm going to ask you to do is prepare an outline of that chapter with a teaching plan to teach that chapter in a Bible study or a Sunday school class. Then, at the end of the term, we will collate all the teaching plans, and every one of you will have at least the basis for a course in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Sound good? All right. So, uh, as you have questions along the way, you can ask me about them, but an outline, um, and then uh, how you would teach it, and incorporate, you can incorporate Cal Institutes, you can incorporate uh, some of the other books I'll talk about here in a moment as well, and to, you can have a suggested reading list. Um, so... It's not just a lecture, though. I want you really to have to teach how you are going to get people to learn this. Could you maybe briefly describe what you're thinking is the difference between an outline and a teaching plan? Well, an outline is what I give you here in the Institutes. A uh, teaching plan would be questions. It would be you're going to divide up into small groups. You're going to give a lecture here. You show a video. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of ways you can teach a course. And so I just want you to uh, make it an interesting course. But mostly I would say discussion, questions, um, lecture outline. Can I have chapter one? Can I have chapter one? Write it down quickly and send it to Ms. Holmes. <laughs> Perhaps we can draw names on who does what chapter. And we'll make sure we cover all the chapters. And then you can collate it at the end. That sounds like gambling. <laughs> I really don't care. Uh, I just thought if people had a preference for a chapter, uh, one that you really wanted is, is really what I'm after. And what we could do is those that have a preference, turn it in, and those that don't will take the remaining chapters and throw them into a hat, and we'll have a big lottery. Uh-huh. Maybe we should ask people to give a first choice and a second choice, because if we get... Emails have time signatures on them. That's why I said first come, first serve. That does make more work for you, but anyway. Uh, it'll be in the order on your email. We'll go to her. Yes, sir. Ah, he's dumb. Uh, you unmute your mic, please. Zach, un unmute your mic. Unmute your microphone. Uh, he's, he's not muted. He's having some sort of technical issue. It would have a mute icon if he's muted. He's, he's I don't know sign language. Um, somebody run get Kevin, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. <laughs> both of you guys, both you guys need to, as you got the email, you need to have the earphones with the microphone on them. So I, I do have the earphones with the microphone on them, but for some reason the mic, I guess, wasn't working. I'll try to get that straightened out. Um, 
My talk question time. was, if you do like marriage and divorce, if your denomination has a, a different, like sub, uh, I guess it uses the original or has made additional alterations or as a testimony, are you to incorporate that or no? No. Because this is just a testimony, and just don't pick marriage and divorce if you've got a problem with the confession and one of the testimony. So that's just, you don't do it. But, no, I, I don't have a problem with the confession. I'm saying, but you don't want to have to, you don't want to do the testimony. Uh, you know, if you were going to teach that in your denomination, I guess you would have to do that. So just don't pick that one. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. I know you don't have a problem. I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, so just don't pick one. And what we're, um, we're going to use for this assignment either the OPC or the PCA um, confessions. That way we don't have to get into trying to whether or not you believe in the Establishment Clause and, and, uh, and we'll talk about these things. But uh, just use, uh, most of you are in one of those two denominations. And uh, if you wanted to use the uh, Philadelphia uh, uh, confession, which is the Reformed Baptist version of the confession, then since that's what you'd be teaching, that's that's okay. Just don't pick the chapter on baptism. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, sir, is there an intended audience or just the church in general for the for this outline? Or is it for the seminary level? Or no, it'd be for a Sunday school class level. Sunday school. Yeah. No particular issue. Oh, that's a good question. Let's say high school and up. Okay. Good question. Let's be consistent. Let's say an adult Bible study. Thank you for asking that. So is this including the larger and shorter catechism? You may incorporate them. Okay. But your teaching plan is to focus. So you can hardly do it without the other, but yes. So, I mean, this is the first time I've done this. Uh, I think it should be good, and we'll find out. It'd be hard to make anything with an A on it, so. Yes, sir? You're, you're not talking manuscript. You're just talking outline. Like, right. So, you're outlining the confession, and then your teaching plan would be, we're going to have questions, discussion group, break into small groups, or if you're going to give a, a, a particular lecture, then... You know, lay that out, how you want to do that, and cover it. Obviously, some of you have never done a lesson plan. That's what this is all the more useful, so. Good. Uh, 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 yes, sir? Uh, would, should we assume that this lesson would be about an hour or so? Like, well, how, how long would the Good. Be yeah, an hour lesson. What would, uh, what would be some key aspects of greeting? For this key? I don't know. <laughs> Thoughtfulness and creativity. <clears throat> Grasp of the chapter. Okay. Right. Grasp, I'll have to work this out. Don't I? Grasp of the chapter. A good outline of the chapter. And then a workable teaching plan. These are good questions. What was the last thing you said? A workable teaching plan. I mean, you could do a seminar on speaking in tongues, I guess, if you were. Really... <laughs> All right. So uh, the outline will be 35% of your grade. And there'll be two exams, 25% each. And you have to uh, pass all three things to pass the course. You can't think, well, I'm going to really ace the exams and I'm not worried about the paper. You, you may do that, but you'll fail. Or you could make a, a really great grade on your first, your midterm, and say, well, I'm not going to study for the final. And you'll fail. So I want you to work equally on all of the... Uh, the assignments. We're really not in the business of grades, are we? We're in the business of learning. Now notice the examinations are to be written in Word, not PDF. 
That way I can much more easily give you um, instructions. I, I mean, I can make comments there. And they're to be sent to Mrs. Holmes because she grades the catechism. She does grade those catechisms. The paper is to be sent to me and not Mrs. Holmes. You may copy her if you're fearful that I might lose it. Uh, but um, it is to go to her. And let me show you this part, which seems to have disappeared. It did disappear. Oh, well, there it is. All right. This is the email when you send things to me. Do not send them to my GPS account because there's only about 100 messages a day in there. And uh, all I really get in, in Gmail, basically, is, is seminary and academic things. So I'm not going to lose it as easily <laughs> if you send it to the Gmail account. So, And again, you're adults, and every time I say this, uh, they either get sent to Mrs. Holmes or to GPTS. So uh, papers are come to me uh, at that uh, address. Catechism and exams are to go to her <coughs> at the posted address. And uh, the papers are due... Papers, you're, I mean the paper, your, your written assignment okay. is due November the 30th. That's the last day of classes. Uh, there was another hand. Do you have your hand up? No. Yes. Uh, for the exams, if we don't have a laptop, do we just take it at home, or how does that work for being here? trying to get a laptop, but I don't know. If we don't have one by the end of the semester. You'll have to hand, hand write it. And I do allow uh, those uh, who English is not their first language, if you prefer to do a written uh, exam rather than take it on the computer, the choice will be yours. It would be easier to hand it to so. and, uh, But if you're just one of those people that cannot think at a keyboard, just tell us and you can take it. Or you don't have to own a laptop. You're about the only person here tonight without one. So, Mark, you know that Taiwanese have very little electronic toys that have been built. So, I'm, I'm sure he's got a, a stash of them somewhere. Um, all right. Expect you to attend all classes. One unexcused absence will result in your grade being awarded one letter. Two unexcused absences, two letters. Three unexcused absences, failure. Request for an excuse to be made by phone, text, or email. Uh, to me, if you want to copy her on the email, you may do so. Or if I don't respond to a text or uh, a phone call. Um, ideally, this is to come in before class. If there's an emergency and it cannot come in before class, to get it in as soon as possible. If you've got a question, is this a valid excuse, uh, and you can figure out ahead of time to ask me to do so. But valid excuses are the baby has to go to the hospital, or you got 103 fever, or your car's broken, or your mother died, uh, things at that level. Now, there'll be church excuses if uh, your church wants you to attend a, uh, a presbytery meeting and it, it conflicts with the time of class. That's, I, I grant those excuses. Um, if you have other questions about an excuse, you know, maybe you need to go out of town for some reason or whatever. We're set up for this, so it's, it's not a problem. Just make sure you tell us ahead of time. Uh, my office hours will be Tuesdays, 9 until 1, and Wednesdays, 12 until 4. doesn't mean I won't be out visiting somebody or at lunch, but uh, you can just drop in uh, any of those times, or you can make an appointment with Mrs. Holmes. And if that does not fit your schedule and you really want to talk to me, then you can uh, make an appointment, to, and uh, I will make sure that... Uh, I can make myself available to you. That's very important to me. 
uh, to be available, as I said to you, at orientation. Uh, distance student emails will be answered, Lord willing, the week they are received, uh, usually much more quickly, as long as they come to the appropriate place. And there is my phone number as well. Um, you don't call my number after about 8 o'clock, 8.15, on a weeknight, unless it's an emergency. You don't call me on Saturdays, whatever time Alabama is playing football. Amen. Other times Saturday is fine. I don't mind missing Clemson. But, uh, of course, when they're playing in the national championship, you can't call me then either. But, um, so, but uh, I get up at quarter to five, and so I try to shut off at night about eight, uh, which I'm not good at, but uh, your phone call wouldn't help me. So, but you may call me any other time. Uh, all right, were there other questions about any of this background material? Yes, sir? Uh, this is How's the baby? Uh, doing well. How's your sleep? Uh, better than my wife. Okay. Much better than my wife. Um, I noticed in the, uh, well, I guess you do have it listed in certain ones. There, we have required reading, and in several of the, uh, at least to the midterm, it doesn't look like we have a layout of uh, basically a reading schedule for those required readings outside of Calvin. And, uh, well, you do. Okay. You can make your own schedule. We'll talk about the schedule in a minute. Okay. They're, they're there. Right. So it's up to you if you want to start a week ahead of time or two weeks. That's your business. Okay. Uh, and that's, I said if you do those books, you can count those into your hours. I said that well ago. Um, so we're talking about books. So everybody, I hope, has the harmony. You need the harmony. I don't want you to have to be zipping around on your laptop between the three documents. Uh, the harmony lists them out. Uh, if you don't have yours yet, they are in the uh, bookstore. So, and this is really a, a, a precious work. It, um, it was originally a, a work that uh, Green did at Columbia Seminary, and Dr. Smith then... Um, kind of brought it up to date. I think there's an explanation here. Yeah. So uh, on the right at the front of the preface, there's an explanation of how this uh, developed. So it's, it's a real treasure. And um, I just want you to have this because it really will slow us down if you're having to zip around in your uh, laptop. And by the way, how did I miss that? Here we go. You may not be on the internet or the web during class unless asked by me to look up something. Okay? You're on the honor system. You're Christian adults. The institutes, whichever is issue you have, um, Chad Van Dick's horn is suggested. I use that as required reading one year. The students ask me not to do that. So... Um, Murray and Witherow are required. Now, if you look on your lesson plan, and we get down here to the sacraments, you'll see a Murray on baptism. That's November uh, the 27th. And then on church, the week before, you see Witherow. Now, they're both very short books, but they're dynamite. They're just excellent books. So... As I said to you last week in chapel, just look at your own schedule and decide at, at what point you want to uh, um, read these books, to have them read for discussion on November the uh, 20, 20th and 27th. I just wanted to verify with you, Dr. Piper. Somebody had mentioned uh, there's two books inside of here. Do you want one of them read or both of them read? There's one on ecclesiology and Presbyterianism, and then there's another one on baptism inside this. Oh, all these modern books. Uh, you talking about Witherow? Yeah, in Witherow, uh, somewhere in there. Yeah, there's, there's actually, because it's a right? Frank, I believe so, yes. I've seen that. Forgotten books. So it's not in the uh, table of contents, because it's really just two books printed separately, but once you hit uh, about a little bit past halfway through, there's a whole section on baptism that's uh, separate. 
No, I'm only asking, I'm glad you said that. I'm only asking you to read with the Rome Church Government and Murray on a Baptist. Yeah, Okay, thank you. So that answer your question, Justin. Yes. So what I've done is then laid out. Oh, so then a couple more books. Um, you notice that uh, in each section uh, we've got. Uh, Belgic Confession, that would be B.C. from that point forward, Heidelberg Catechism, H.C., Canons of Dort, C.D. Now, Dr. Beeky and Dr. Ferguson prepared a harmony of the Reformed Confessions. Now, it also has the Second Helvetic uh, Confession as well. Now, the disadvantage of this book, it keyed to uh, the Dutch uh, standards and not to the Confession. And... So you have to search around a little bit. I'll show you some of that tonight as we do that. But it's well worth your while as part of your four hours reading simply to consult this as well and get exposed to those other uh, Reformation uh, confessions. I'll actually make allusions or references uh, through the lectures uh, to various things in them as well. So I highly recommend uh, you getting this. And then the seminary... Uh, publishes a commentary on the standards by Francis Beatty. And we have plenty of them. I've checked. They're very inexpensive. I had ignored Beatty, and I was actually listening to a lecture by Dr. Smith, and he explained Beatty. Uh, what's unique about this commentary is that it is uh, on the short, it, it looks at the standards to the short catechism. Whereas we'll start with the confession and look at the catechisms. Uh, but it's, it's really quite good. The, the chapters are useful and uh, they're short. So uh, I would you know, really encourage you to uh, dip into Beatty as well as Van Dick's Horn. All right. Any other questions at this point? Yes, sir. Uh, so I don't see that there are actually the uh, banner of truth Confession uh, version. Is there a particular reason? Uh, we well, there is that? because if you look at it, it's the old, uh, the original. Okay, that's which I do want everybody to have. In my later courses, I require it because of the back documents. Okay. Uh, this has the directory of worship, the, f the form of government. It has a number of pastoral covenant letters. Huh? Even the covenant between the England and Scottish. Yes, the National Covenant we will talk about tonight, Lord willing. A letter by Manton about family education and nurture. That in itself is, is worth the price of the book. So, no, I do require that. Uh, it's excellent. Um, and uh, but and it's fine to me it, have it in here. All I want you to have the harmony because that's actually Dr. Smith's text is going to come out of the uh, older text, I believe. So, um, so here's how the course is going to be laid out. Tonight, Lord willing, we'll get to the historical background, confessionalism, and scripture. <coughs> Next week, God, Trinity, decrees, fall, covenants, etc. <coughs> As I said, we got to change the schedule uh, back a week for each course. So what that means is your midterm will go through effectual calling and justification, and then you'll have five, so you'll have six and five, I guess, on the, uh, on the midterm. Um, well, that's six. Okay, six and six. And uh, You've already put the new calendar on. I'm, I'm going from my... Uh, Are you going from you? You've corrected all these things, yeah. right? Yeah. It's it's Four things. She's going to take this course. I'm going to have to quit asking her questions and <laughs> enjoy the course. All right. Any other background questions? Can I just uh, 
clarify the four hours reading? Okay, uh, you may. Uh, any upperclassman will tell you that I am the grammar Nazi. And so I will correct your grammar uh, because it's very important. Uh, you're going to be uh, spokesmen, spokeswomen uh, for uh, the Lord God. So um, may I ask you a question? It's the American English version. And since we all live here, we'll do that. One of my pet peeves is, um, well, you'll find out soon enough. I just want to ask, <laughs> if I recognize you, don't preface it with, I just want to ask. Uh, and then, I'm not going to do too much grammar with you guys right now, but uh, maybe a little bit, just to help you. But it's really important. I know that 80% or whatever of Americans couldn't care less. That's not could care less, it's couldn't care less. And, uh, but we strive for excellence right and so we want to be excellent in this and grammar is a matter more of hearing than of rules and so you learn to hear bad grammar it's a the illustration doesn't work much longer but it's like fingernails on a chalkboard when you hear bad grammar most of you don't know what a chalkboard is even so but <laughs> um and so the other thing I want you to do is when you're listening to these inane people on the radio or television, just mentally correct the grammar, and you'll get really busy. It gets worse and worse and worse. But uh, So anyway, you may ask me a question. I'm not picking on anybody when I do that. I'm, I'm going to laugh. We're going to all laugh together, right? So uh, my question would be for the four hours then. Are you saying we should essentially see the required reading and then the suggested reading as a pool, and from within that we read four hours, and then we may possibly have parts of the reading that we're not going to be doing then? Or just, I would like to start Somebody tell him what I said. What did I say? I know it should be in writing. What did I say? Four hours of Calvin. Four hours Calvin, or we get down to Murray and, and uh, Witherow. The other, you're, I want you reading. I want you working on this course six hours a week. That's just kind of the graduate school, isn't it? Two hours outside of class, for every hour in class. I think that's fairly. It's probably junior college even. But um, so I know you've got a lot to do, and if that gets to be a burden, tell me, okay? But um, the, the the free two hours. I don't know that you'll need it. That's said to memorize your catechism and uh, read uh, in the standards for the for that week. That's in the four hours in the institute. So is that, is that clear now? It should be in writing. It's not. That's my fault. Four hours in the institutes are. You can count Murray and Witherow as part of the four hours a week. But I'm not assigning pages. I just, you know, I want honesty, but um, we, we all read at different paces. It has nothing to do with our ability or anything else. We just read at different paces, and so I'd rather you devote yourself to what you're comfortable doing. There's a hand back there. I'm sure there was. What will the exam be like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions uh -huh. as we go through the confession. I'd pay attention to those. Mm -hmm. okay. No. All right. Um, there'll be 25 or so one-sentence answers. And I use it for 25 points. I usually give you about, if, I, if it's 25, I give you 30, so you get five extra points. That will include your catechism. So 25 or 30 of those, and I'll give you extra. That way, if you don't remember a couple of things, you still could get a very good grade on that section. Then normally you will have, it's a three-hour exam. Uh, normally then you would have uh, some essay questions that I try to frame pastorally, such as, 
a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, how would you answer them incorporating the material from the larger catechism? Or you have a person in your congregation who uh, lacks assurance using the confession of faith and scripture at any time you want to, but you must have the points from the confession because that's uh, how would you counsel them? So, some factual things that will cover the whole basis of the six weeks to make sure that you just got the basic facts down. And I want these, the essay questions, I want also to be fairly either thought provoking or pastoral uh, in there. And normally what I do with essay questions is uh, you'll do one out of two or two out of three. Maybe have two sections, one like that. Yeah, maybe have about three essay questions all told. So you go 25, 25, 25, 25 points. But on the essays, you won't be locked into just one. You'll get to pick one out of two. So can we bring the confessions when we are doing the exam? No. <laughs> It's, a con it's an exam on the confession. <laughs> it is preparing you for a presbytery exam on the confession and catechisms. They won't let you bring it. <laughs> now, these are all good questions. I understand. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making fun. But they are. And, uh, do they ask these kind of questions if you go to college? Okay. <laughs> no, I was looking. <laughs> All right. Well, then, if we're ready, and my normal plan is that we go uh, an hour and about uh, 40 minutes, so we take a 15 minute break, and then we finish out the other part of the class and finish at 7 30. Is this time framework for everybody? And then uh, the any, any time that uh, we will conflict with the ladies' fellowship. And so when it's just a ladies' meeting, only you ladies may slip out then at 7 o'clock to go to that and just listen to the last bit of the class on MP3. And when we have couples, uh, any of you that intend to go uh, that night also may, as long as you go there and not home, uh, <laughs> slip out at 7. And I think in October they assigned me to lead a discussion on this book, The Gospel is Hospitality. And so we'll all slip out at 7 o'clock and just finish the class down there. <laughs> all right. There'll be a lot of humor because it's, it's, it makes a long night, and that's okay. All right, I want to start with um, why, as Presbyterians, uh, are Reformed Baptists, why do we have uh, uh, confessions? And from its inception, uh, the Reformation used confessions and catechisms to uh, summarize and teach its doctrinal and practical understanding of the Christian faith. So Luther produced two catechisms. And the early Luther summarized their faith in the Augsburg Confession and later in their Concord. Uh, Calvin produced two catechisms. Uh, the Continental Reformed produced in uh, Belgium, the, uh, the Netherlands, the Lower Netherlands, uh, the Belgic Confession. The German Reformed produced the Heidelberg Catechism. And then, of course, the Canons of Dort uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the British Church produced the 39 Articles. And then, and by the way, you can just sit there and admire my handsomeness. I'm not going to test you on this. And in fact, I'll be glad to send you the lecture. I need to make a few edits on it. So just sit back and enjoy yourself. If I intimidate you, please go down to my study, go through the sitting room, into the sacred room, look to the right, look up on the wall. Tell me what you see. The English produced the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechism. The English Baptists produced the London 
confession. So all that is Reformation era uh, confessions. But in modern evangelicalism, what we hear is no creed but the Bible, no confession but Jesus. And a good portion of our Christian friends then reject the use of creeds and catechisms, and they do so because they believe that the Bible alone um, is sufficient to guide us and that creeds are man-made additions to the Bible. How many of you all heard that? Okay. What I want to seek to demonstrate is the Bible commands the church to make and use creeds. I'll show a little bit about their purpose and then talk a little bit about uh, our view of subscription. And I base this on the passage that we read in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Before we begin to open this up, let me give you some definitions uh, so we can all be on the same page. The term creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. Your personal creed states what you believe and what's important to you. So really, if you say, I have no creed but the Bible, what have you just done? Established a creed. You just established a creed. You have established a creedal statement. This is what I believe. It's a personal creed, and there are actually the worst sort, as I'll seek to show you. Um, you're saying, I believe neither I nor the church need a creed, the Bible alone is sufficient to guide me. But throughout history, the church has used creeds to summarize what she <coughs> believed the Bible taught. Her creeds and confession gave a precise summary of cardinal doctrine. So think about the Apostles' Creed, or a detailed refutation and articulation of a particular truth under attack, such as the deity of Christ, the Nicene Creed. So Arla Dabney defined a creed as a summary statement of what some religious teacher or teachers believe concerning the Christian system stated in their own uninspired words, but they claim that these words fairly and briefly express the true sense of the inspired words. The church records several creeds of individual Christian teachers, but the creeds of the modern Protestant world are documents carefully constructed by some church courts of supreme authority in their several denominations or by some learned committee appointed by them and then formally adopted by them as their doctrinal statement. Now, they usually differ in form. A creed consists of a series of brief, succinct statements expressed as I or we believe. So the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed. A catechism uses questions and answers to teach the truth. And a confession is normally a more detailed exposition of the truth. Now, in the remainder of this lecture, I will simply use creeds uh, for shorthand to talk about all three creeds, catechisms, and confessions. Then the biblical basis. Are they biblical? Well, in 2 Timothy 3, or 1, 13 and 14, I think I can show you that Paul commands us to use creeds. We have a twofold commandment. Retain the standard of sound words and guard the treasure entrusted to you. Now, many opponents of creeds argue that they detract from the sufficiency of Scripture. I'm trying to show you that Scripture, in fact, demands creeds. Now, Paul gives here a two-fold summary of his message. He first referred to the standard of sound words. Sound words express truths taught by Scripture. Words are the expression of truth that Timothy received from Paul, who was directly taught by Christ. The term sound means um, true and accurate. So you could say, it's rare these days, but my doctor made a sound diagnosis. <laughs> um, and so 
Uh, that's, what, that's what sound means here, true and accurate. There are doctrines then that give life. Paul says, in pointing these things out to the brethren, you'll be a good servant of Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith. Interesting. The words of the faith of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So the words of the faith is further summarized by this concept of sound doctrine, 1 Timothy 4.6. You can also see there 1 Timothy 1.10 and 6.3 and 2 Timothy 4.3 and Titus 2.7. And you could consult here and ought to Dr. Knight's commentary on the pastoral epistles as he deals with a number of these phrases. Now Paul communicated uh, these sound words to Timothy in a summary that he calls the standard or form. He uses a compound uh, word here Hupotoposis. So, toposis can mean a pattern, a form, or an example. Uh, not hupos, type, tupos. And tupo, type, that's the word type. And you know that word uh, in the Old Testament, types, which were pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul uses tupos in uh, Romans 6.17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. So there was a form, there was a pattern of teaching to which Paul refers. This is the content of the gospel given in a summary statement or form. Now 1 Timothy 1.16 uses the, uh, and it is hupo, uh, toposis, I was correct the first time, uses hupotoposis to mean example. Paul says that he is an example of one who received God's mercy and patience. And you know as Paul uses the term example, he's setting himself up as a pattern. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. In non-biblical Greek, the term hupotopos is used for the sketch of a painter or an architect. So you go to the art gallery, you'll see oftentimes that before the sculptor or the uh, painting was finished, there would be sketches. And uh, that is how this word was used in classical Greek. So in Moulton Milligan's lexicon, they give the meaning sketch in outline, now looking at a verbal sketch, or a summary account. Art and Gingrich say that here in 2 Timothy 1.13, that it means a standard. And E.K. Simpson says that the signification of a summary or outline which Galen assigns to the word best tallies with this context. Sextus Empiricus repeatedly uses it in that acceptation, in, the way, in that manner. If so, it presents yet another sign that epitomies, epitome is a summary, epitomies of the Christian faith were beginning to pass current. And that would be in 1st Timothy, or here are Simpson's writing on Ephesians. Uh, no, excuse me, he's writing in 1st Timothy 1 through 13. He says also that logoi in the plural would naturally mean propositions. So not simply words, but statements of propositional truth. So as you look carefully at this verse, I think that Paul is declaring he's given Timothy a former pattern of apostolic doctrine. He's not referring to the entirety of the inspired corpus because it wasn't available. And yet that's exactly why the church needed the summary because there was not yet uh, a complete uh, accessibility of all the inspired New Testament letters to the early church. So he gave Timothy a summary. Now in verse 14, he refers to the summary as the entrusted treasure. Entrusted treasure. In other words, this form our pattern of sound doctrine is a treasure that Paul entrusts or delivers to the guardianship of Timothy. So he says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, um, 
referring to the stewardship uh, to Timothy to entrust it to others. The things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There must be the ability for them to pass on the summaries, the treasure here of God's Word. So Paul's referring to a summary of apostolic doctrine he'd given to Timothy. In other places, he calls this the traditions. 1 Corinthians 11.2 Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Obviously he's talking about something here other than simply the words of Scripture, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians 2.1 So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Interestingly, we note here that the taught traditions were not simply those doctrines he revealed in epistles, but also the doctrines he taught them verbally. The summary of the apostolic message. See also 2 Thessalonians 3.6. Now, sometimes, some of you, your antennae have gone up. I start talking about traditions. Doesn't Paul um, speak against traditions? And isn't that one of the problems with the Roman Catholic Church? Well, the traditions against which Paul spoke uh, were those that were unbiblical, such as the traditions of the scribes and Pharisees, with man-made laws, not summaries of Scripture. In the Roman Catholic Church traditions is this mystical corpus of uh, material passed on from the apostles secretly, generation to generation, somehow the Pope passed them all. And so these traditions are not out of Scripture, they are in addition to Scripture. And that's the big difference in a biblical tradition, such as that referred to by the apostle, and the wrong traditions. Now, what Paul, I think, commands here is reinforced by the Bible's use of creeds. Give me an example of a biblical creed. Not, well, I mean, a, a creed in the Bible. Yes, sir. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, there's a, a, a creed, a confession. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Probably the very first one in the Bible, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Repeated every Sabbath in the synagogue. Uh, Philippians 2, the Carmel Christian. Philippians 2, statement of Christ. Some think that's a hymn, but it's clearly a summary, whether it was sung or not, of apostolic uh, truth. First Timothy 3. Right. Great indeed we confess in the mystery of the godliness. You don't get confused by the word confession there, because assuredly or confessedly, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh. And you've got clear parallelisms here that flash out the whole humiliation, exaltation of Christ. And by common confession simply means uh, assuredly, confessedly true. Dr. Knight argues in his commentary that the... Um, um, faithful words that he quotes, uh, that Paul quotes in the epistles are in fact little brief confessional statements out of the early church. So the Bible, I think, not only commands creed, but patterns for us the use of creed. But then we can add some other arguments to the use of creeds. First, to stop and think about it. Every Bible translation is the creed of the man or the group of men that translated. One of the original is inspired. God never promised inspiration to translate this scripture. We want them to be faithful, but we have to understand that human presuppositions, which I will illustrate for you now, uh, can cause reputable translators to mistranslate passages of scripture. And I'm going to illustrate this, and you, by the time you graduate, I'm sure you'll all be convinced from my favorite translation of the Bible. It's not the ESV. It's surely not the NIV. It's the New American Standard, 1995. Now, uh, I'm actually a, a uh, common text, Byzantine type person, but I still like this better and just go back and consult that when it differs. So it's known for its accuracy. It's the most literal, in a readable sense, of uh, any Bible translation. And when they do give you, um, 
they choose a, one text to read over another, they give you a footnote and tell you what the other text had to say. Except, here, in Acts 16.34, we want to compare the NASB and the ESV, which normally doesn't come out on top in these comparisons, but it does today. Uh, so this is uh, Paul preaching the gospel to the Philippian jailer. And the jailer brought them into his house, that'd be Paul and Barnabas, I guess, and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Now, when you read that, as they've translated it, with this whole household modifies what? Having believed in God. The ESV translates this. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. In the Greek, the participle phrase uh, with his household uh, is attached to um, rejoice, not believe. Grammatically, there's no way you can attach it to believe. But here my favorite translation lets me down. Which, by the way, is why we want you men to walk out of here in three or four years really able to use the Greek and Hebrew. So you'll be able to uh, detect when there's differences in translation. Don't just get locked into your favorite, but make sure you check it. Um, but here's the other one. This was actually more glaring. Uh, and the NSB's translation of Mark 7, 4, that when they came from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they cleansed themselves. And there are many other things which they observed, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. Now, the ESV adds the words, and dining couches. Now, this is a textual decision. But what's interesting is the text that the NSP follows has dining couches. It is their preferred text. But because, no insult, these were Baptist translators, anything that seemed to point toward either a family uh, coming to Christ, as in Philippians, are here, at least some baptism, because this is the word baptismos, that not all, but many Baptists will argue means immersed. Obviously, if this meant immersed, you had to uh, dunk your dining couch, and I guess they just wouldn't last that long. Uh, so, um, but the UBS has dining couch, and the NASB follows the UBS regularly. When it doesn't follow its preferred translation, or when there's another textual or preferred text, or there's another text that has strong competition, you know what the NASB does. It gives footnotes. There's no footnote here. When the ESB is good about it, they give alternate readings when there's strong textual evidence, which here is quite strong, uh, and actually the ESV, which doesn't normally give textual references, uh, gives here the footnote pointing that some manuscripts omit dining couches. Now, I'm not arguing for the one or the other at this point. What I'm saying is this is simply two examples to show you that uh, godly men translating scripture let their creedal preferences shape their translation. Is that not a creed? Moreover, Dabney points out that really every preacher's sermon is a creed. We're not up here reading the Bible. If we have no creed but the Bible, then it'd be really easy. I mean, if you were really an accomplished reader, it would be better. But you can get up and read a portion of Scripture quite dramatically, and, and your sermon's finished. Because you dare not offer a human word about the text. No creed but the Bible would have no preaching. Dabney, beyond question, God has ordained as a means of grace and indoctrination the oral explanation and enforcement of divine truths by all preachers. 
Thus Ezra causes the priest to read in the book of the law distinctly and give the sense and cause, give the sense and cause them to understand the reading. Paul commanded Timothy to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He, as an apostle of Christ, not only permits but commands each uninspired pastor and doctor to give his charge, his human and uninspired expositions of what he believes to be divine truth. That is to say, his creed. If such human creeds, when composed by a single teacher and delivered orally, extempore, without elaborate preparation, are proper means of instruction for the church, by the stronger reason must those be proper in Scripture which are the careful, mature, and joint productions of learned and godly pastors delivered with all accuracy of written documents. He who would consistently banish creeds must silence all preaching, reduce the teaching of Scripture to the recital of the exact words of Holy Scripture without note or comment. Do you see the logic of this? Now, it goes further. I would add, the church's creed protects us from the tyranny of eccentric and heretical ideas of an individual expressed in a sermon. And we've all heard them. Remember, there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Here we see that rather than violate sufficiency of Scripture, the Scripture requires the use of creeds. They don't challenge the authority of the Bible, but are simply summary of what the church believes the Bible teaches. And in fact, the Westminster Confession of Faith asserts that the Scripture is the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and whose sentence that Scripture we are to rest. No other than the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture. All right, Justin has just notified us that the 15th. There's some things that I've been adding uh, that I would not got put into your uh, syllabus. But uh, if you look here, Thomas Watson, Body of Divinity. You should be cons put that in your uh, consulting. You'll love Watson if you don't know him. White's Exposition of the Shorter Catechism. Joe Moorcraft, uh, five volumes, Authentic Christianity is a commentary on the larger catechism. Uh, I really enjoy it. Now, the problem with reading Moorcraft is like kind of reading Carol and Job. Um, I'm two-thirds of the way through volume one, and I have not finished the doctrine of the Trinity quite yet which is next week's lesson. So, but uh, Joe is a very clear writer, but also one of the broadest sources of the material that he consulted in putting this together is, is uh, really it, all kinds of systematics and different, different things uh, available. It is a bit theonomic, um, but in a, you know, in a balanced way, I say. So, uh, and then um, also uh, Vincent, I haven't typed him in here yet, on the catechism, um, Shorter Catechism. Of course, everybody knows Williamson on the Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism, G.I. Williamson, and that's in fairly new form. That's useful. <coughs> Ridgely is the uh, <coughs> larger catechism. <coughs> Mine's in two volumes. Joshua says there's a four volume addition is probably easier to handle. And then Voss has an excellent one-volume commentary on larger catechism. Shaw has a commentary on the Confession of Faith, and uh, of course A.A. A. Hodge has a commentary on the Confession of Faith. So I'll get all those others written out and we'll get them added to your, uh, your syllabus. I just ran out of time as I was pulling books and, and looking uh, at them. So you get your four hours in Calvin, you're, that's just going to whet your interest and you go look at some of these other guys as well. There's a funny thing that happened with this Shaw, it's Robert Shaw, right? Yeah. I, I When I become a friend of Dr. Shaw in the Facebook, I asked him, is, he, is this guy is your ancestral? Ancestral, what was the name? Ancestor? Ancestor, yeah. Is this guy your ancestor? I don't know, it might be. <laughs> yeah. 
Frank Smith. So I just was given some other uh, reference material, but I'm going to put a post on them. Cheated and you were late, so Sorry? I cheated and you were late, so that means you missed me. No, that's all we talked about. All right. So let's look at the use of creeds, and they serve as a pattern, uh, as a summary for communion and communication. Communion. And communication. One of the primary things the creed does for a church is to promote unity. So Amos asked the question, do two men walk together unless they've made an appointment or have an agreement? We cannot walk together unless we are agreed. Think how useful it is for the congregation and those who visit the congregation to know what the church believes and is going to teach and preach. <clears throat> so in the Dutch churches, the Continental Reform, who have the Dort, Belgic, and Heidelberg, they actually call their standards the what? Three forms, of Three forms of unity. Because it is around that sun that the planet of their belief uh, revolves. In this, the church is not adding to the Bible that says we believe that this is what the Bible teaches. If you're going to join us, you need to be aware of these things. <clears throat> now, in, pres in, the, in the Dutch churches, the Reformed churches, all the members have to subscribe to the standards as well. In Presbyterianism, it's the office bearers that need to subscribe, and I'll explain subscription in uh, a moment. But that guarantees doctrinal harmony in either case, but when it's in the Presbyterianism or in a Reformed Baptist Church, uh, if you go there, you know that the officers are committed to this. And you're going to be submitted to it, and you may not come in there and uh, be subversive. So in Presbyterianism, what Sammy Miller called the Presbyterian doctrine of liberality, uh, we would allow uh, a Baptist to be a professing member of our congregation. And they come in with the understanding that they're going to keep studying the issue, they will not absent themselves from any infant baptisms, and they will not try to lead others into their position. So they know what we believe, and if they are happy with that, uh, in terms of we can worship here and be a part of this body, and be involved, so they can teach Sunday school or, or or whatever, they cannot be an office person. Uh, I think that's important. It's, you know, I've, I've taught elsewhere. And one of the, the glories of teaching here is that we know and you know they're all on the same page. We're agreed. We're unified. I mean, we I have a, obviously have our intramural differences with respect to a, a text of the Bible or the millennium or maybe the text of scripture, but uh, uh, anything in the confession, we are in common agreement. And it's just a glory to work in that context, and I think you'll find it's a glory to stay in that context. We're not going to compel you to believe these things. We'll seek to convince you uh, that they are biblical. But um, it's really a pleasure. And as I, as early on, I was coming over once a month before I, I moved here, and I said to some friends, I said, you know, here, we have genuine collegiality. So if I'm writing a critique of framework, I can go to my Old Testament man and know he agrees with me <laughs> and won't be offended that I'm writing this critique of his view of creation. Uh, it really is quite refreshing and liberating. So for communion, it's very important. Well, some will say, well, isn't that binding people's conscience? Well, no, the church is a voluntary organization. And nobody's compelled to be a member of any church. And so you go to the church that's going to be most consistent with what you believe. And if you don't believe it, then don't go. Go to someplace else. I've been working on a piece to say that to the progressives in my denomination. Hey, you'd be great, EPC. Why stay here and try to wreck us? They, they believe like you. Uh, you know, you've got liberty to go there. Nobody's holding you back. 
So <laughs> it's really beautiful. Communication. This follows both interpretation and instruction. So the analogy of faith, interpreting Scripture, we might get to that tonight. Um, the Bible interprets itself and never contradicts itself. Well, creeds, confessions, and catechisms give us the consensus of the major truths of the Bible. And particularly as people learn catechism, it gives them a grid to examine what they hear in the pulpit or what uh, they read in the Bible. So, for example, uh, you read in 1 Samuel 5, 15, 11, that God regretted making Saul king. Well, <coughs> your, your re reflex action would be, well, God changed his mind. But the child, you learn the child's catechism, knows that's impossible. God doesn't change. God doesn't change his mind. And so, all right, is there another way to understand this that's biblically accurate? Well, yeah, there is. God uses uh, anthropomorphisms. He uses figures of human thought, action, emotions to describe what he does. Because we're made in his image, that's how he connects to us. And actually, in that chapter itself, he goes on to say, when Saul tries to get things changed, God does not a man, he does not lie or change his mind. <laughs> And so again, Scripture interprets Scripture. But that's where the catechism uh, helps. Now, closely connected with interpretation is instruction. And it's a great way to give a Christian a compendium of the faith by teaching them the catechism and the confession. In the act of proving the weapon to a larger catechism, the General Assembly of the Scottish Church commended this catechism as a rich treasure for increasing knowledge among the people of God. Because the shorter catechism is for children. Not the children's catechism. The shorter catechism was for children. The larger catechism was to give um, a means of increasing knowledge among the people of God. <clears throat> I know I don't have time, but I've got to tell you Warfield's story. If you read Warfield on the uh, shorter catechism, um, <coughs> he tells us his truth. Uh, I mean, he heard his truth. It sounds great. Uh, uh, it could be true. But uh, this, there were two men walking down the middle of a street, kind of Clint Eastwood style, in this western town. I mean, everything was going crazy. People were drunk, some people shooting guns. And they were just calmly walking down. I think one of them was an army officer walking down the center of the street. And as they pass, Mr. A says to Mr. B, what is man's chief end? Mr. B stops and turns around glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Mr. A says, I knew you were a catechist boy. There was a demeanor. There was a confidence that these two men had in the midst of chaos. And that's back in the days when the great majority of people in our country knew uh, the Shorter Catechism and its significance. Uh, <clears throat> Moody tells a story if he was visiting a friend, or actually, again, uh, I think War, uh, Warfield tells a story, that Moody was visiting a friend in London, and a young man who had been in his preaching comes to ask him questions. And one had to do with prayer. This guy was unconverted, he didn't, he didn't understand. You know, what's prayer? What are you talking about? Uh, uh, when you talk about prayer, I can tell, I can't tell what you mean by it. So Moody was talking with the young man, and as he begins to explain, his host, nine or ten year old daughter, starts down the steps in the house. So the host interrupts Moody, addresses his daughter. Tell this gentleman, what is prayer? Jenny did not know what had been going on, but she quite understood that she was now called upon to say her catechism. So she drew herself up, folded her hands in front of her like a good little girl who was going to say her questions. She said in her clear, childish voice, Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. Ah, that's the catechism Moody said. Thank God for that catechism. And that's what happens when we use this great summary of the Christian faith to teach 
our children. Today, to teach ourselves. And, and when I pastored, we had the adults in the congregation trying to earn uh, the, the catechism. So it's a great means of community communication. It's also a great means of protecting the faith. You know, Paul says here in verse 14, guard the treasure and trust. Jude tells us to contend for the faith because the faith is under attack and the church has the responsibility uh, to defend it. Paul says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before too long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, part of the responsibility entailed in being a pillar and support is the defense of the truth. So how many of you have had either a Mormon or a JW cultist come to your house? Okay. And you asked them, do you believe that Jesus is God? The Son of God, of course. We do, we believe, just like you. That's when you use the catechism. Do you believe this? Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures in one person forever. And you flush them out. Very simple question. You flush them out. They cannot affirm that. And you've also presented the truth to them. So it's great for guarding the truth as well. Well, quickly some spiritual use of the creeds. We see uh, what they're for, but how would he use them? Notice the language that Paul uh, uses. Um, he says in verse 13, hold the form in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Now notice there's no dichotomy here between vital faith in Christ and creedal orthodoxy. Just hold to it in faith. If our creed is biblical, it will point to Jesus Christ as the Savior of sinners. We will hold to our creed and express its truth in a way that acknowledges sincere Christians will not agree on every point. We will contend for the truth with love for God and our neighbor. And moreover, our creeds will direct our attention to the beauty and glory of the triune God. The grand purpose of doctrine is that we might know and serve God. Thus the church will make her confession with praise and adoration. We hold our creeds then evangel evangelically. But now in verse 14, we're to hold to the guard of truth spiritually. Guard through the Holy Spirit. And here we're reminded our, our creeds are not cudgels to beat people uh, over the head. To accept our position, we are to guard this good deposit in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. He alone will cause men and women to understand and embrace the truth that we love. So Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth, <coughs> and they come to their senses, and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And so we use the creeds humbly, in faith, in love, in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Now a couple of times I've used the term subscription. And within our confessional churches, Presbyterianism and ARPCA, the uh, Reformed Baptist uh, group, um, this has to do with office bearers in the church taking a vow that they hold to the doctrines that are stated in the Westminster Standards or in the Philadelphia Standards in case of the Reformed Baptist. So since the beginning of the 18th century, Presbyterian churches in Britain and America have sought to protect orthodoxy through what we call subscription vows. Glad y'all looked up there. <coughs> Came off all the way. Now, those of you that were at convocation heard these vows. So the first one is, do you believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? The second vow, do you sincerely receive and adopt, and this comes out of 
The first time American Presbyterian, I think it was about 17, 20, 22, adopted the confession. He received and adopted the confession of faith and catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures. And do you further promise that if any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system, you will in your own initiative make known to your presbytery the change which has taken place in your view since the assumption of the ordination vow? Now, currently in, in our denomination, the PCA, and in some other Presbyterian denominations, there's two approaches to this second vow. They can be summarized by the terms full subscription and system subscription, or as uh, uh, the broader people in my denomination have talked about, good faith subscription. There's nothing good or faithful about it, in my opinion, but maybe I can show you that. Other terms like strict or loose, um, but I prefer uh, the terms that uh, I've stated out here, full and system. Full subscription maintains that the second ordination vow requires the adoption of the confession and catechisms, not just the system of truth. Dr. Smith wrote, it holds that the ordinand is subscribing to nothing more nor less than the entirety of the confessions and catechisms as containing the system of doctrine. Notice that the first clause of the vow is, do you receive and adopt the confession and catechisms as containing the system of doctrine? You say you're not adopting a system. That's a system subscription or good faith subscription where they've twisted around and say, I hold to the system of doctrine in the confession of faith. Do you see the difference? If I hold that the Confession and Catechisms uh, have a system of doctrine, I'm saying I hold to them in the system then that they teach. System subscription says, I may pick and choose. And so I hold to the general system that's found in the Confession of Faith. But each presbytery now may decide what is a real exception or a serious exception or really no exception at all. We immediately put communion out the door, haven't we? If two or three don't agree, how do they walk together? And so that's where we are. There's a, a subjectivism now that has entered into our church courts. So you come to Calvary Presbytery, one here where I'm a member, which is one of the more conservative confessional presbyteries, and there's all kinds of things that would keep you out. If you went to a, another presbytery, and I won't mention names, um, none of those things would keep you out. So then you want to transfer from that presbytery to Calvary Presbytery. What happens? Well, no, we can't accept your confessional views. You see, it's chaos. But it's also dishonest and very lazy. If you don't think the confession teaches these things, there's a way open. And that is, do the exegesis, write the papers, and convince the rest of us you're right. But all that's happening with system subscription is that we're watering down the standards, and so more and more people are allowed an exception. Pretty soon the majority hold to the exception, and the exception becomes what? The rule. Now y'all have got this problem in Brazil. Yes, sir. I, I always had a doubt about this kind of approach in terms of subscription. Uh, how one can subscribe the system, the system that the confession teaches, can't. but not adopt them all? Right. Because if it's only one system, yeah. you know what I mean? The language of yeah. the subscription is... But it's even more so. I adopt the Confession of Catechisms as containing the system. I'm not adopting the system. Yeah, but I'm adopting them, what they teach the system is. Yeah, but my point is, even if you adopt the system, it's only one system. So you can't... Well, well yes, but that's not the word game they play. Once you adopt... The system, it can be your system. So you choose the system. That's right. So it's it's, it's subjective. It's systems. systems. Yeah. In practice, are the systems. We, we literally should force, should have forced at the time to change the ordination vow. And we probably still should. Because there's no way you can believe in real words, having real meaning, objective truth, and do what they're doing. Do you envision a time where uh, a Presbyterian is dominated by people who have 
X, Y, and Z exceptions. Oh, and I, I come in and say, well, I'm a full subscriptionist, and then they're like, well... Oh, I know of cases where they've tried. We have a, uh, one of our graduates in a presbytery, and they put off, he had a call from a church, and they stalled for over a year. And in the floor of his exam, he's actually accused, you've just been a spy sent in here to find out what we really believe. He was a Greenville grad. He was full subscription. His church knew that and wanted him. And they tried to keep him out. Now they didn't win. And I was about to go to the General Assembly with it when they let him in. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I envision that. I mean, we've already had guys. Uh, we had an instance where uh, Josh Sparkman, and this is not even the confession, it's the uh, Book of Church Order, and we really teach you guys that there's no such thing as an assistant pastor in Scripture. That every pastor, part of the authority of the congregation is to call a pastor. It's one of Witherow's principles, which I think are confessional. And um, so our guys go to Presbyterians and they'll say, well, we don't agree with the Book of Church Order and assistant pastor. And uh, they made, they put Josh to all kinds of hoops for just trying to say that I don't think... And we don't even have that tied of subscription to the Book of Church Order. Whereas, I just preached Sunday night for another graduate who was installed in Hattiesburg, and he took that exception, and a ruling elder stood up and said, I've never heard this before said by anybody, but I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> so yeah, and there's more serious things as well. Uh, so, Yeah, there are presbyteries that are probably dominated by the uh, a lot of error. Yes, ma'am. Um, Thank you. Full subscription is to whatever confession the not so the OPC and the PCA have a, a modern American version. It's not it's not real modern in English, but uh, with the changes that the American Presbyterian Church made. So it actually says, if you remember the, our subscription vow, we took it at uh, convocation, to the confession as adopted by the Presbyterian Church in America. Right. So no, not the 1646. Thank you. Dr. Kripa? Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Um, has anybody tried to define the system beyond just maintenance? Presbyterian of East Christ and said, well, this is actually the essential system that undermines... Yeah, well, it happened in the uh, 19th century with the Auburn Affirmation, uh, which uh, they determined that, well, these are the, whatever they were, how many uh, things you have to hold to uh, if you're going to be a Presbyterian minister. Um, so it's been tried. Uh, that one was pretty watered down as it was, and there were still the liberals resisting the Arbor Affirmation. So, any more questions about subscription? This doesn't mean that we think that the standards are inspired. Uh, I read to you already the, the paragraph that says that uh, the scriptures trump everything. Uh, and again, if a man comes to a conclusion that this doctrine is not scriptural, he has a course of action. He tells the Presbyterians change of views because I would like to study this. I'd like us to write a paper. Uh, let's do the exegesis. And uh, that is uh, an avenue that's always open because we don't think. And then one more thing. Then we have what's, what we call scruples. So also, full subscription doesn't say I'm subscribing to every word. And this is where system comes to play. Every word in the confession of faith, that's only the Bible. So I subscribe to all the doctrines. That's the system that's taught. Let me give you some examples. Uh, the regular principle is taught with the elements, the primary elements of worship. And it says singing of psalms. I'm no longer convinced, Mr. Dotson, that that is exclusive psalmody, but that the church must sing all the psalms. But if, in fact... Um, the presbytery believes that this is requiring me to sing psalms, and I would say I scruple the exegesis of that one statement. I think that we should sing psalms and all the psalms, but I believe the Bible requires me to sing hymns as well. So that's not an exception to the system. That is an exegetical scruple. Our Dr. Knights 
to the uh, exposition of the Lord's Prayer, where it expounds in the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer. And he says, I scruple that. I don't think, I, he says, I think it's true. I don't think that language is, because in the, not the text is not there, I don't think that language is in the text. So those are the kind of, I'd rather than call them exceptions, scruples. Still holding to the, the whole system, but not to every word or every exegetical expression within that system. Uh, Dr. Piper, you mentioned earlier that within the Dutch tradition, uh, members as well as officers are required to subscribe. Uh, in the Presbyterian tradition, only the officers are required to subscribe. And you had brought up the example of baptism. Um, how does that practically end up working? If the confession says that baptism is a, you know, a means of grace and ordinance, uh, and that neglecting it is a great sin, a grievous sin, or whatever the exact verbiage is, uh, how does that not become an issue going forward of like church discipline? Practice? Because there's, uh, and Gerstner makes this distinction, there's, there's sins of fallibility and there's sins of contumacy. That's a good word. So a sin of fallibility is we all are fallible. We're fallible sinners, which means that none of us know everything perfectly. And we all get to heaven, then you'll realize everything I've said is true. But until we get to heaven, you won't, you won't have that opportunity. Man, you know, that's a joke. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, there are sins of thought and practice that you would be told they're sins. But 2 Timothy 2, wait for the Spirit to give repentance. Another example would be a Sabbath. So a family comes into the church and they are not convinced that uh, recreation on the Lord's Day afternoon or public type of recreation or watching a football game on television is a sin. They're not going to miss the evening service in the rare churches that still have one. Um, uh, so that's a sin, as you all well know, I think. But it's a sin of fallibility. And so you, the, you're going to hear regularly in pastoral visitation and in the pulpit, keeping the whole day holy to the Lord. Uh, and so, but we're going to bear with you. So that's, that's how I do that. So a sin of fallibility then is a... Contumacy is simply a really fancy word for just being downright stubborn. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to do that. And there are lots of people like that in the world too. It's a good word. Fallibility in the other word is con. Huh? C-O-N-T-U-N-A-C-I. Contumacy? Contumacy. Okay. Is that a good word? The word of the day. Yeah. Does full subscription include subscribing to the proof text attached to the confession? Good question and no. Assembly was actually forced to provide proof text by the uh, parliament. They didn't want to do it. And part of that is a methodology uh, there are many truths in the Bible that you're not just going to pull a verse out and uh, improve it. The doctrine of the Trinity would be, would be such a doctrine. Uh, and so, methodologically, when they say by good and necessary inference, which we'll talk about, um, but they were asked to, so they did. Uh, later, the OPC did a thorough revision of the proof text. Uh, but they didn't have to adopt them. They didn't amend the confessions. It was, I think, a, a unanimous vote was able to have the proof text changed. Uh, and so they're probably, I mean, they're, 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 their proof texts are a bit more reflection, I think, of modern, good modern exegesis. Although there's yet been a generation in the Bible like the Westminster Divines and you see that time and again, and you might at first wonder about a proof text, and then you start pondering it, and, oh, I see that. The other thing I want you to notice as you read the standards is the great percentage of phraseology is simply scripture. On the other hand, what's how we're an evangelist? What? <laughs> Just trying to keep you guys awake. So I wish I were an evangelist. 
with our other hands. <laughs> um, when did the when did the idea that big tent versus subscription was more important for unity? When did that really? When the heiress wanted to have their ways. Well, they don't care about unity. When a big guy left the church because Dr. Smith and I took it to the General Assembly, he was letting women in the pulpit. Uh, a year later after he left the church, then we get started getting this good faith subscription. I was really surprised. I'm such a, I, I know, I'm likable on my hand. I go to Hannah's house and do I'm not likable. Come on. I'm surprised that people don't like me and I in my denomination. <laughs> I mean, I really am. I'm shocked at some of the things I hear about myself. It's been sanctified. It's good. It's good for me. So, yeah, uh, we, we were the boogie bears. So we had to get a, a more open-minded. It's Open-mindedness is much more, much more important than unity. It's just like the culture, isn't it? Political correctness. That's a fake unity. So Justin really shouldn't have said something about Hispanics today. Quite offensive, <laughs> even though he's Hispanic. <laughs> All right. Any more questions about subscription? So in addition to, to what Josh just said, subscription is for the unity research. Is it also uniformity for, for uniformity purposes? Well, uniformity is necessary for unity. Yes, that's why it's the three forms of unity. So we we can agree. Well, take it for granted. You know, we post on our website, and it's a shame we have to do this today. Um, any churches that agree with our standards of worship that want to be in the travel directory can send it in. They go in the GPS travel directory because now you go. Uh, to uh, a church that has Presbyterian in its name, it's in the PCA, less times the OP, sometimes in the RPCNA, and uh, you go into the zoo, the circus, and it's awful. There used to be a uniformity of worship. And there's no longer a uniformity of worship, again, because of this whole approach of everybody does what's right in his own eyes. Doesn't that beg the question of the, the, the value of creeds and confessions if they aren't establishing conformity or unity? Why bother? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, because we want to be, be considered Presbyterian. All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I think what I'll probably do is send you um, uh, this as well. So just a little bit of historical background on the assembly. The assembly grew out of Puritanism, which really developed uh, under Elizabeth I and after Mary, uh, uh, Bloody Mary died, Elizabeth comes to the throne well, then many of the English reformers who had been exiled or fled for their lives under Mary came back now to uh, England uh, and Scotland and were looking for uh, room for reformation. They'd been in the reform centers of Zurich and, and Geneva and Strasbourg, and this is the vision they had. And uh, Mary, being a, a brilliant politician and having inherited a country that was... Uh, you know, split right down the middle. If you think about it, in a matter of, uh, uh, of 11 years, or go maybe say 15 then, they'd been a Roman Catholic Church, an English Catholic Church, a Protestant Church, a Roman Catholic Church, and uh, this is the turmoil that took place in a very brief period of time. So when Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is also threatened by her she really rightly a, a legitimate daughter of, of the king and uh, all the machinations against her as well. And she was a brilliant politician. So she developed the, the via media, the middle way. So she was, in her convictions, Protestant. 
Um, but she was also determined to have a, uh, a, an ecclesiastical government that was under her, through bishops and archbishops, and um, compromise. So no Romanism, but no radical uh, Protestantism. So it's in response to that that Puritanism developed uh, with these men who had tasted of something better uh, desiring then to uh, reform the church. Well, uh, when she died, James uh, VI of England uh, came to the throne, first of the Stuart kings. And James, well, the, again, the Presbyterians were very encouraged because he'd been tutored by the, the Scottish reformers. And uh, they, surely he's going to be sympathetic uh, to them. By the way, why was he called James the first if he was James the sixth? First being in this first of England, sixth of Scotland. Very good. Yeah. He was the first English king named James. He was the sixth Scottish king named James. So that's how they get those numbers after their names. It's very logical. But um, more than a Protestant, James the first was a Stuart. And the Stuart had bred into them the divine right of kings. And he recognized the only way to preserve that was to have a church under his thumb run by bishops who would answer to him. And so under the Stuarts, the persecution became uh, more severe. Uh, but then his brother, uh, Charles I, comes to the throne Excuse me, that's his son. Charles I comes to the throne in 1625. This is where our story picks up. He was high church. He was a, had a Roman Catholic wife. And he was moving the church towards Roman Catholicism. His henchman was named Archbishop Laud. <coughs> who went through some political offices. He was privy counselor, so kind of the chief counselor to the king. In 1629, he was the Bishop of London, which actually was the most powerful church position uh, in the land. <clears throat> and then uh, in 1633, he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now let me give you a quick look at English ecclesiastical history. There were two geographical divisions in England. Canterbury and York. York in the north, Canterbury in the south. But the first was Canterbury. That's where uh, the missionary uh, Augustine landed when he was sent out by Gregory the first and began the work of evangelizing Great Britain. <clears throat> so Canterbury, with its cathedral, is the center of uh, British Christianity. So these two uh, archbishop centers are centered around cathedrals. So there's the Cathedral of uh, Canterbury and there's the Cathedral at York. Then, in each district, there are bishoprics. And they also are divided up now in geographical divisions. And the bishop then is the next uh, authoritative person under the uh, archbishop and really the king now in the act of supremacy is the head of the church now Mary I mean Elizabeth defined that for the sake of the Puritans in those things that apply to my rule so they could live with it but she surely expected more so really the uh, the monarch would have the great say on who these people would be. So Charles I appointed him. He then had the great say in who these men were, and then the individual uh, parish uh, congregations were in the geographical area of the bishops. So as you're reading it in British history, uh, and you come across these figures, and these would have ministers or priests uh, in them. So archbishop, bishops, and then ministers or our priest. That's the division of the church.
that goes all the way back to Romanism, uh, to <clears throat> late uh, Christian church, and it was uh, ossified in the medieval church, and it's what the English church inherited then from uh, the Roman Catholics, and they simply changed heads and made the king then of the church and not the pope. So this was the structure <clears throat> that was they were able to suppress Puritanism, and Laud then became the head of Canterbury, which put him really over the entire church. And he began to enforce these high church policies of the prayer book that had many Romish uh, things in it. Um, he began what was quite strange, archiepiscopal visitation in every diocese. These things that I call bishoprics were actually diocese. That's the area of the bishop. And rather than the bishop being responsible to visit the diocese, the uh, archbishop began to do so because he was pressing for his his authority and uniformity in the church. <laughs> he uh, did many moral things that were good, but he began to persecute uh, the Puritans and used uh, illegal structures such as the Court of High Commission and the Star Chamber, which is where you would torture people in order to get them to conform and get confessions out of them. His uh, big tactical mistake was in 1635, he imposed the prayer book on the Church of Scotland. These were diehard Presbyterians. And so in 1638, you heard the story of, of Ginny throwing her stool at the bishop. It's probably apocryphal, but it gets you the idea of, of how the Scots felt about all of this. And so in the February of 1638, they signed the uh, National uh, Covenant where they covenanted with life and blood and property to resist the uh, episcopacy um, with might and may. Now that led then to <clears throat> warfare between the Scots and the British. Now Charles, being a Stuart with divine rights, did not want Parliament. Now again, the British system uh, is not dissimilar to our system, uh, except in, in that you have two houses, and they're called Parliament. And there's Commons, and there's Lords. And this has been established by English common law. They were things that began to develop all the way back to the Magna Carta, granting certain liberties to uh, commoners uh, in England. The lords were made up of the key nobility and the bishops. And the commons were made up by then uh, commoners, who many of themselves, though, were also of no noble families, but only the oldest brother got the title. And so these were still, uh, there weren't originally many uh, just middle class people in commons. That did happen under uh, the long parliament. So. <clears throat> Um, but being a steward, Charles didn't want Parliament because Parliament was kind of a check on the king. So he dissolved Parliament in 1629, intended to rule without Parliament. So he came to the throne in 1625. By 1629, he dissolved Parliament. Uh, but he had to raise money to make war on the Scots. Now, as I understand it, one of the things that came from Magna Carta is the king could not tax directly. And so he had to have Parliament to raise money to fight the Scots. So he called a Parliament in 1640. Now the English are very inventive with their titles for Parliament. And that Parliament was called the Short Parliament. Now you know why it was a Short Parliament? It was made up of Puritans and he quickly dissolved it. <laughs> but he lost another battle with the Scots. So he needed more money. So now he calls Parliament again. And guess what? It was called. Long Parliament. <laughs> Theoretically, it went up to about 1659. Now, it went through some iterations under Cromwell after uh, after the Puritans left at the uh, uh, prosecution of the uh, or the beheading of the king. Um, it became then a rump Parliament. So it was a long Parliament, but it, all the Presbyterians were out of it. So it was just, and this is where the the bakers and the mechanics and whatever. 
uh, began to come into uh, and Parliament as uh, well. This Parliament was made up of very godly uh, uh, landowners and lawyers who had all been uh, infected with Puritan preaching, pastoring, and discipleship in books. And so they, they were ready. Uh, as Parliament was called, uh, there was a, the Root and Brant's petition in 1640, 15,000 signatures, uh, and that called for the abolition of prelacy, Root and Branches. So that's how it got the name Root and Branch. Wipe out Episcopacy, prelacy, Root and Branch. Um, in November 27, 1641, Parliament passed a petition and remonstrant address to the king called the Grand Remonstrance, and accused papists, corrupt bishops, and clergy of subverting religious justice, and wanted the king to limit power of bishops and deprive them of their vote in the house of the Lord, and to have a call for a synod of divines, with some from other parts, to submit the results of his discussion to Parliament for ratification of amendment. Charles definitely did not want that, and he refused to sign it. And I've read it, it was four attempts, and finally the fifth attempt, they did it without a signature, which is why Archbishop Usher, who was a godly reformed man, and greatly influenced the assembly, they used his catechism, and that's another, if that was on your, I think that was on the, it'll be on your list, um, but he would only be a consultant, for, he, was, he was voted to parliament, but because the king wouldn't endorse it, uh, he would not participate as an actual uh, a delegate. So then, on December 10th, 1641, the king demanded obedience to established laws. Another petition was signed um, by a group of London ministers calling for a free synod of grave, learned, and judicious divines and a regular monthly fast. In 1642, January, the king foolishly entered commons, which is illegal, unless he's invited. <coughs> Uh, to arrest five Puritans, including John Pym and John Hampden. Uh, of course, Parliament refused. So, what people don't understand, they, you know, they, the states of crime all did wrong, but it was the king who began the Civil War, not Parliament. So, August 22nd, the king raised his standard and gathered an armed force and marched against Parliament. Now, that plays a significant role in the development of the Westminster Assembly. Initially, uh, parliamentary armies were led by lords who didn't know a lot about military, and they turned to Cromwell. And Cromwell developed the new model army that marched out then in 1644, and by July of 1644 defeated the Royal Army at Marston Moor, when you go to England, you have to go to Marston Moor. And then, um, in 1645, final defeat was at Naseby. The king was arrested. And... Laud was executed in 1645 for acts of treason against English. But the king was beheaded in 1649. Now that is the real trauma. Even the Brits that don't care a lot for the king just don't think you should kill him. But the king actually had been in secret negotiations with the French to invade England. So I think he deserved to be beheaded. But that really, most of the Presbyterians didn't. They opposed it. Even others like Owen, uh, um, so he lost his position then at uh, Oxford, I mean at Cambridge, not Oxford. Uh, and so that's when the Rump Parliament became the Rump Parliament, and it was later then everybody came back. Um, so, under this then, because of the war, and because the, the parliamentary army was not doing well, uh, the Parliament wanted the help of the Scots, who had been at war with the King over these issues. So they appealed to the Scots, and the Scots were ready. We will help you on the basis of the covenant that we've made. 
Because what the Scots wanted was to guarantee they'd never again have somebody try to force a pistol be down their throat. And they really longed for a reformation of real religion in the three kingdoms. So Ireland, uh, Scotland, and uh, England and Wales just being kind of a, a part of, of all of that. So they agreed uh, if the English would sign off on the Solemn League and Covenant. And the English did that uh, September 25th, 1643. Now listen to this paragraph. I don't think it's in your notes. No. no it might be. No, I, no, that's not in your notes. Okay. Uh, we shall, s and by the way, it's in that Banner of Truth uh, edition right there. Um, we shall sincerely, really, and constantly, through the grace of God, endeavor in our several places and callings the preservation of the Reformed religion in the Church of Scotland, in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, against our common enemies, the reformation of religion in the kingdoms of England and Ireland, in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, according to the Word of God, and the example of the best Reformed churches, and shall endeavor to bring the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of government, um, directory of worship and catechizing, that we and our posterity after us may as brethren live in faith and love, and the Lord may delight to dwell in the midst of us. Now, they didn't ask for exact parallelisms of what they were doing in Scotland. Notice uh, a uniformity, a nearest conjunction and uniformity, that there would be a confession of faith, a form of church government, a directory of worship, and catechizing. Now the English swore to the National League and Covenant. It's a pipe of theory that one of the reasons that in 1666, when uh, Charles II came to the throne, we had the great exile of 2,000 Puritan ministers and the church went through great persecution from which it really never recovered in terms of the Reformed faith uh, in England. So early 17th century, many of the descendants of these men were Unitarians and Deists and everything else. I, God takes seriously vows. As much as I like Cromwell, when Parliament broke that vow, which is what it was, sworn to God, well, the commandment says God doesn't take that line. And so, you know, in the conjecture of history, I think that uh, much that went wrong then in the English church uh, after the, I mean, how in the world could, after the West, 50 years after Westminster Assembly, England be such a wreck spiritually? I think, for me at least, that is a strong conjecture. It reminds you and me of the seriousness of our vows, our marriage vows, our church vows, our baptismal vows, our ordination vows. God takes them seriously. Because of the National League Covenant, though, the Scottish were able to send uh, theologians to participate in the Westminster Assembly, not to vote. They didn't need to vote. They were so powerfully persuasive uh, as they worked with the men, and so highly respected. Men like uh, Rutherford and, and Henderson and, and uh, Gillespie uh, coming there to represent the uh, Scots. So they worked on these documents. They first uh, approved the Directory of Worship as passed by the Commons in uh, January 3rd, 1645, the Scottish Parliament, February 6th, 1645, the Scottish General Assembly, February 3rd, 1645. The form of government didn't do quite as well. Um, in the Assembly itself, the majority were Presbyterian. There was a handful of strong independents there were a few Episcopals, and there were three Erastians. Uh, now, Erastians were people that believed that the state had authority over the government of the church, church discipline, appointment of ministers, everything else. Um, the independents would be like our independents today, and the Episcopal I just defined them. Majority were Presbyterians. But the problem was that the Parliament itself probably had a majority of Erastians. You see, nobody was looking for an independent church. I mean, there were a few that wanted a, a, a non, a separatistic congregational church. 
But even the Congregationalists wanted the con to be the state church. They wanted a state church to be governed congregationally. And that was just that's the, the flavor of the times. Uh, and so it was much more difficult to get any kind of good Presbyterianism. So the, the, the form of government is good as far as it goes, but it is weak. And it was never adopted by Parliament. They adopted propositions. And those propositions then went up to the Scottish Church. Resolutions were passed containing the substance of Presbyterianism in Parliament, but they were it was adopted by uh, the Presbyterians. Excuse me, you were saying that the majority of the Parliament were Erastians just before the Parliament, the, the Parliament, the, the, the English, political. English Parliament. Yes, before the, 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 the like the income of the Scottish help or. Every, every, almost everybody was an Erastian. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So even with the Scottish guys? Oh, no, they weren't. Oh. I'm t get, you must not confuse Parliament and the Westminster Assembly. Oh, okay. See, right. Parliament was yeah. the House of Commons and the House of Lords. All the bishops had been kicked out. Uh, they were making the political decisions. But they had to prove everything that was done by the Westminster Assembly. Mm. So the Westminster Assembly then consisted of... Uh, Skipped over that part. Um, like One thousand. No, excuse me. They met. Here we go. At one hundred and twenty ministers and thirty laymen. Only about half that number, maybe seventy-five or eighty, attended uh, with any regularity. All the divines had episcopal ordination because that's the only ordination you could get in England. Uh, there were two Erastians and divines, but several laymen, independents, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians. So uh, they first met then um, in uh, July 1st. Uh, they met in 1643 to 1649. William Twist was the prolocutor. That's, he was the chairman. They began business on the 8th. So they adopted the form of government, the directory of worship, they got down to the confession. Initially, the Synod was simply going to uh, revise the 39 Articles, which is the Anglican. It's a very, very reformed document, uh, but it had ambiguity in it. But when the Scots entered into the covenant and were going to take part, and, and they had this agreement now about a, a common confession, they realized they had to have a true common confession. So they put aside that and worked on the confession of faith through committees and the committees report to the body as a whole uh, they go back and they would finally present something to a parliament it was finally approved in 1647 and the scottish church approved it in august of 27 1647. the catechism uh, 1648 approved by parliament and approved uh, for public printing september 15 48 the Scottish Assembly approved it in July 24, 48. Shorter Catechism, November 5th, 47, finally approved uh, in 48, uh, both for printing and by the Scottish Church. So that's how we get to these documents. Um, there's never in the history of the church, in the opinion of many historians, been a, a theological assembly uh, that could even rival uh, the Westminster Assembly. These were the godliest and the most bright exegetes of the age. And you read their, their own works and sermons, so well versed in Scripture, in Reformed scholasticism, in the institutes and the early Reformers, in the church fathers, in the medieval theologians. Uh, it shames me when I realize the breadth of, uh, of theological learning uh, that these men had, but the love for Christ and His church and His glory. In my opinion, there's nothing that can parallel what in God's providence those men did in the uh, 1640s. I trust you'll see that more and more as we work our way uh, through it. Uh, it's really the standards of all Presbyterianism throughout the world translated into uh, 
Portuguese and Japanese and Chinese and Korean and on and on and on shaped the Church of Scotland, shaped American Presbyterianism. You read these great stories. I told you about the Shorter Catechism guys, but uh, James Henry Thornwell, new Christian, goes into a bookshop looking for something, and the guy suggests he gets the Westminster Confession of Faith. It turned him around. And I just read another story in St. Davies biography, another man that discovered the Westminster Confession of Faith. And it is absolutely phenomenal. And we praise God that uh, he put together these men. Uh, this was the last of the great confessions. Uh, we began there with the Belgic. And we conclude then, um, over 150 years later, I guess it is, with Westminster. It ain't scripture, but it's the best summary of scripture written by men. So let's jump into it. We only have about 23 minutes, but I can at least get your interest wetted. And we'll have to go really fast then. Uh, so. The way we're going to do this is we're going to read round robin, and then discuss. So we're going to start up there with uh, Mr. Dotson. If you'll read paragraph one and, no, excuse me, let's back up. You read Larger Catechism one and Shorter Catechism one. That's not going to work. Get you fixed for next week. All right. What is the chief and highest end of man? Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Interestingly, that here's where the catechisms begin. This sets the tone for the Westminster uh, documents. Direct our attention to the glory and enjoyment of God. That's what you'll hear us talk about experiential or experimental Calvinism. This statement is what it's all about. This is to be our heartbeat, our lifeblood, because it's the heartbeat and lifeblood of Scripture. Now, it's interesting, the Godward direction of the Westminster Standards there are those that talk about, and I love the Heidelberg Catechism, that it's so uh, practical and devotional, but the Heidelberg, one of my only comfort in life and death, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins, delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair of my head can fall, uh, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore by his Holy Spirit he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Now there's a difference here. What is it? It's a glorious statement, but there's a significant difference. Yeah, one is Godward, the other is manward. Our standards start out with this absolute focus on God. Heidelberg starts out with a focus on man and his comfort. And it's a good statement, believe me. But in terms of setting a tone for what wants to be accomplished, you see why I would prefer uh, larger and shorter catechism, one. All right, I need to get up this... Uh, Come point as well. We're really prepared for you guys. This is, Ms. Holmes has been great. If I were prepared, it'd be a lot better, wouldn't it?
All right, so introduction to reform theology. Uh, so the tone is set with the catechism. This is a, we're going to focus on God and glorifying Him and enjoying Him. Now the next difference is that the uh, uh, three forms of energy start with God, but the confession of faith starts with the book. Now why? Because how are they to know God? What does Calvin say in the Institutes? Knowledge of God must precede knowledge of God. So there's only two wisdoms, knowledge of yourself, the knowledge of God, knowledge of yourself cause you to look to God, God back to yourself, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the knowledge of God that is the most important thing uh, in uh, your life. And so we start here. Uh, now, the Belgian Confession does have a great um, introductory uh, quotation. Oh, no, this is Warfield. This is great. There is certainly, in the whole mass of confessional literature, no more nobly conceived or ably wrought out statement of doctrine than the chapter of the Holy Scripture, which the Westminster divines placed at the head of their confession and laid at the foundation of their system. That's in volume six of his collected works, page 155. That's why we start here, and that's the character of that with which we start. Now, the uh, confession begins with a statement then on natural revelation. I think because of time tonight, I'll read, y'all be prepared next week. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they're not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His salvation. So there are two sources of this natural revelation. What are they? Conscience and creation. So we've got the phrase, the light of nature. Uh, in Calvin and the Institutes, here, light of nature has to do with that which uh, is innately known by the sinner. The remnant of the law of God written on the heart, conscience. That's what Paul will appeal to then in Romans chapter 2. In every image bearer of God, conscience is at work. So that's the first form, Romans 2, 14 and 15. And then the second way uh, that God reveals himself generally is in the works of creation and providence. And that is what is around us in this glorious world and what is unfolding daily in God's works of uh, providence. <coughs> so Belgic Article 2 with respect to this general revelation, we know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as the most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many characters leading us to contemplate. Isn't this beautiful? Yeah. The invisible things of God, namely His eternal power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul saith in Romans 1.20. All which things are sufficient to convince men and to leave them without excuse. So the preservation and government of the universe before our eyes as an elegant book. So these are the two forms then of general or natural revelation. And what are they sufficient for? Sin, rendering us without excuse. To condemn, to leave men without excuse. So I don't know as much any longer. It used to be you do evangelism and either you get one of the questions. What about those people in Brazil who never heard the gospel? Well, they didn't say Brazil, but Africa. So, uh, are they going to hell? Are they? Well, that's not fair. They don't haven't heard the Bible. Well, how could a just God send them to hell? 
They have God's law written on their hearts. All right, they've got these two things. They've got the law of nature, and they've got this elegant revelation of God that is in creation and in providence. Which, Paul says quite clearly in Romans 1, they suppress. Understand, there is no truthful atheist. Everybody knows there's a God. Don't be intimidated. They can throw up all these fake arguments. And what you need to learn to do is to press the sore spot, <laughs> the conscience. Even the, even the stones are speaking about that. Uh, yesterday, I listened to a podcast with Jordan Peterson. He's a psychologist. Jordan Peterson. Yeah, he's a psychologist from Canada. And, and he's, he was arguing. He, he didn't go so far that uh, there is no such a thing as an atheist. But he said that the majority of those that proclaim themselves as atheists didn't behave as a right. There's even one, he's not a Christian, but he's just a powerful conservative uh, yeah, yeah, voice. Exactly. When we were in Atlanta for General Simba, I never had heard of him. And there was, uh, we were walking from the hotel to the restaurant, and there was a theater there right off of Olympic uh, Park. And all these young people, I'm talking about millennials and younger, were lined up. I thought, it must be a rock concert going to go on. They're going to go buy their tickets, you know, they had their books to wait in line. And up on the marquee, it's this George Patterson, Peterson? George, 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 George Peterson. Peterson. And so the, the erudite who were with me explained to me who he was. But all these young people, they wanted to hear this modern prophet of critiquing the, uh, the modern age. So yeah. Um, so Calvin says that uh, God, for two reasons, does this leaves men without excuse because they know there's a God and they know they have a soul. They know those two things. They know there's a God and they know they have a soul. So the use of it is to reveal divinity, goodness, wisdom, and power of God in order to leave man without an excuse. But, as it says, uh, They are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and of His will, which is necessary unto salvation. So there is a use, but there is an insufficiency. Now before we go on to the next part of the paragraph, what's the difference between what the confession calls light of nature and natural theology? Or is it? It depends on what you mean by natural theology. So you're going to posit a possibility of natural theology? Yeah, possibility of natural theology is that men do theology only with, with the creation. This is an impossibility, actually. Okay, so can you do real theology as natural theology? No. Okay. Well, not in this sense, yeah. Definitely not in an aquatic sense, neither. You can't just come out and say, right. that, oh, there's... No. Light of nature has to do with that which is known uh, by the uh, imprint of God, um, the sense of deity, uh, conscience... Uh, but that and what we see around us and in providence is suppressed. And Calvin uses that great figure that you can only read general revelation with the spectacles of Scripture. So even a Christian must look at general revelation through Scripture. So one of the things I ran up against when I was teaching out west and dealing with creation was they wanted to make natural uh, uh, revelation and special revelation co-equal. And nobody in the history of Reformed thought has made them co-equal until the past 20 years. And so we have to read Scripture by natural revelation and natural revelation by Scripture. No. There can be things that in, natural, in, in, in creation that will cause us to go back and look at our exegesis, such as a Copernican uh, universe, but there was never that was never ever resisted on the basis of exegesis. And that was resisted on the basis of philosophy, moving the church from a Platonic philosophy to an Aristotelian philosophy, and that's why these men were persecuted, uh, not because of Scripture, 
Um, they profess to be Christians, and I think it's Galileo has a Christian profession attached to everything that he did. Um, uh, but that's very different than, all right, you know, I'm looking at this, is, is there a proper way? Well, we know the Bible uses idioms. And so even today, I guarantee you that the weather people this morning said what? The sun will rise at 535. The sun rise at 535? Yes and no. Um, but in the idiom of which we speak, we haven't changed that idiom. Because we look at the heavenly things from a perspective of this earth on which we stand. And so we can understand the Bible's use of the sun standing still. If it happened today, I, I'm sure we would describe it exactly the same way. Oh, the sun stood still yesterday. Wasn't that amazing? Because that's how we talk. When we get to matters of creation, we have to realize everything that's going on in evolution and in the claims of modern science is simply fulfilling Romans 1. It is to suppress the truth. God's shouting. And they're trying to shut him up. And now what does the church do? Well, you guys must be right. And so we'll, we'll follow you, even though you're trying to shut God up. For me, that's the bottom line. We'll come back to that when we get to, uh, to creation. So the scriptures are necessary um, to have salvation. And then it says that God reveals himself in two stages. It pleased the Lord at sundry times and divers manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church. Afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary those former ways of God revealing His will unto His people be now ceased. So, what are the two stages of revelation that the confession is dealing with here? The verbal and written. All right, very good. Good way to put it. Verbal and written. So, picking up the language of Hebrews, chapter 1, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal himself to declare his will unto the church. And the sundry times through the history of Revelation from uh, Moses, who begins to write in, what, 1400 uh, B.C., through the apostles, say, uh, 70, I, I believe that John finished in 70 A.D., that period of time, um, and then in three ways that Moses, God spells out to Miriam and uh, Aaron when they oppose uh, the leadership of Moses in Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Hear now my words, that there's a prophet among you prophet is the mouthpiece of the Lord. I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He's faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth. In the first place, God would reveal his will primarily through prophets. Deuteronomy 18 shows us the institution of the prophetic office. Uh, the word means mouthpiece or uh, a mouth of God. Um, primary purpose of the prophet was to declare the will of God. The predictive work of the prophet was always secondary. Um, but God did reveal himself to the prophets in three ways. Dreams, visions, and orally. Um, a dream, a prophetic dream, is not much different from a dream that you'll have tonight in terms of the reels of the subconscious are running in the theater of your mind. The difference was uh, God put the film in and caused it to run. And at the end of it, you knew that this was a special message from God. I hadn't had a dream. Have you had a dream where you woke up and were convinced that God was telling you something? If you did, talk to me later, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but these men did, didn't they? Uh, Pharaoh and, and Nebuchadnezzar and, and the men in the prison and whatever. 
uh, because these were, it was a divine dream. So it was ingenious, like our dream. It's just a different projection, projectioneer. Uh, and that's the way that God revealed himself most often to the least spiritually mature uh, and in other types of circumstances. Now the vision uh, is the prophet seeing something with the eyes of the soul. So sometimes it was an out-of-body experience. And so Ezekiel, his body was lying by the river Chebar and, and the Holy Spirit carried him to Jerusalem. Other times it is uh, like a trance and he might be seeing something with his, his sensual eyes and yet it's clearly a vision. Uh, and that's uh, one of the primary ways. And so prophets were called seers and, and often we'll talk about the burden of the Lord. Uh, but then with Moses and others, God also would speak uh, verbally uh, to them and give them these messages. Now, inspiration, and I think Warfield points this out, inspiration is the fourth type. It also is a revelation, but here we see that afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. So, he uses the, they use the word inspiration then at the end of paragraph 2, all which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life, and we'll come back to that. But what we have at the end of this is that God then, out of mercy to his church, preserved uh, the portion of that revelation. So revelation, divine and foul revelation, would be this big, and inscripturation would be this portion of it, that which was absolutely necessary to save for the life of the church, for the better preserving and propagating of truth, for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and malice of Satan in the world. These things were committed unto writing. And this is what we call then the Holy uh, Scripture. And Scripture then is necessary for uh, salvation. Uh, Joe Moorcraft says there's three reasons it's necessary. Man has a finite mind. God is infinite. The incompleteness of general revelation and man's sinfulness. So the summary then of the uh, first paragraph is here. General revelation, which is also called natural. It's called natural because it's taking place through nature. The sense of deity, conscience, creation of providence. It's called general because it was given to men, to mankind in general. Two things, conscience, creation of providence. Special revelation, which is also called supernatural, because it came by these extraordinary means, but called special because it was given to and for the church, not to the world but to the church, is this verbal revelation and then the inscripturation of a portion of the verbal revelation. Well, we're only nine paragraphs behind. <laughs> That's okay. I'm thinking the class this size, I will probably do the reading and then ask questions. I think that might be a more efficient way to get through this. Uh, but I will go down. I'm going to ask questions uh, alphabetically so I'm not just gonna and there'll be questions I throw out just kind of uh, a thought questions to let the roosters fight but uh, I also will be asking you questions individually if you're taking this for credit all right folks enjoyed it I do hope you have the background though I always found in school that uh, I go into stuff without the background and it's always a bit frustrating. So you've got more background, both about why we have confessions and why we subscribe to confessions and how that's important, why that's important to us here, and then to get started um, in our uh, study.
This has been a presentation of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary.